Welcome everyone. We try to find a seat here and we'll get started. My name is Ed Stone and it's a great, great pleasure for me today to be able to uh, start off today's proceedings to honor uh, our great friend and mentor, uh, Jörg Kolder. And then we have some distinguished guests here with us today that I'd like to uh, welcome to begin. We have President Sally Mason and her husband, Ken. <laughs> Lynette Marshall, President and CEO of the University of Iowa Foundation. John Robillard, Vice President for Medical Affairs. Paul Rothman, Dean of the College of Medicine. Ruth and Marty Carver. And their son, and their son Noel Carver. And then the other major figure in today's proceedings, we have Rob Mullins. And his wonderful family sitting behind him, his wife Becky, his daughters Jenna and Natalie. Unfortunately, Jörg uh, could not be with us today, but in his place, and who would have been here uh, anyway if he had been here, of course, his daughter uh, Veronica is here uh, to be with us. Well, I have a few remarks. I'll, I'll try to be uh, uncharacteristically brief, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know none of you believe that, but that's, that's okay. Um, but I came uh, to this department in 1986, and uh, shortly after I came in and, and saw that uh, title up there above the uh, blackboard, which was in our old department as well, dedicated to progress in ophthalmology, uh, just moments behind that, uh, I met Jörg Kolder, who really embodied that uh, throughout his uh, entire career. Few people, uh, Jörg was a wonderful anterior segment surgeon and for a couple of decades was the first person that a new trainee would do surgery with. Think about that. I mean, this guy had a heart of steel. <laughs> he could sit there and you could tie the suture so tight that the eye looked like a mollusk. <laughs> and the patient, of course, was awake and so you couldn't say something like, oh my God, or something <laughs> like that. And so Jörg, Jörg would go, <coughs> and that was equivalent to screaming, okay? If he did one of those little coughs, it meant look all over the surgical field, there's something really bad, and like, you're like, let go of whatever it is that you're holding on to. But anyway, uh, so Jörg is known to most of us as this wonderful uh, surgical teacher, cataract surgeon, and so forth, but what fewer people realize is before he went to medical school, he had a PhD in electrophysiology, and he actually entered ophthalmology as a human electrophysiologist. And so, Shortly after uh, I came to the department, I was a, uh, had a PhD in molecular biology and, and genetics, and I had a goal of studying the molecular biology of inherited eye diseases. And one of the first ones that I encountered in 1986 was this one. Uh, this is called Best Disease, characterized by this large yellow lesion in the center of the retina. And the, there was an electrophysiologic test in those days that was used to diagnose this disease, and it was called the electrooculogram. And Jörg did a lot of work on the electrooculogram in the early day and was actually uh, a real expert in that. And so Jörg uh, helped me build this device that you see depicted here. This is circa 1988. I built this gray thing in my garage on Princeton Road here in Iowa City. And it's a portable uh, EOG machine. And we drag this thing all over the Midwest and lay people down on their floor or their bed or whatever and tuck the little drapes in around their chin to figure out whether or not uh, they, had, they had best disease. And in doing that, we were able to diagnose dozens and dozens and dozens of patients uh, with this disease. So in 1993, uh, I had the opportunity to see this lady 
who uh, was 83 years old at the time and came in and she had oh, 2300 vision or so and looked like she had age-related macular degeneration but indeed uh, had best disease and had a history as you can see down there in my handwriting of a number of other family members who were affected with this disease. And uh, she was uh, concerned about her family and uh, worried uh, about what effect this was, disease was going to have on her children and her grandchildren. And I remember uh, sitting with her. She was in the hospital for another reason. She was in the hospital in the internal medicine service for another reason. I remember sitting on uh, the bed with her and talking to her about the research that was ongoing here into this disease and our little gray box and all that. And I remember telling her that we were going to find this gene and figure out uh, what was uh, in their family. And sure enough, we did uh, find that gene, and this is the mutation uh, in their family. Figured that out in, in 1998. And just a few years after that, uh, through the generosity of that lady's son-in-law and his two brothers, there was created here at the University of Iowa a nonprofit genetic testing laboratory that now offers that test worldwide for $200 each. And we now get uh, this test mailed into us from around the world, 22 different countries last year, uh, because of this family connection. And so that uh, lady that I showed you, uh, the 83-year-old, was uh, Ruth Carver's mother that I had the uh, privilege to see back when I had been a faculty member for about an hour and a half and probably had no business uh, assuring her that we were going to find the gene. But I felt optimistic, and by God, it turns out that if you believe in stuff, sometimes it happens. So <clears throat> Ruth and Marty and other members of the advisory board of the uh, Carver Family Center for Macular Degeneration know about this project. Uh, labor congenital amaurosis is a um, blinding eye disease of early childhood. It's very rare. We estimate there are only about 3,000 people in the United States with this disease. And there is now a treatment under study for one form of this disease. And so it became very important to try to go find everyone with this disease so that we could potentially, so that we could potentially uh, treat those children. Uh, Derek Lee, the first baseman of the Chicago Cubs, and Wick Grosbeck, the owner of the Boston Celtics, both have children affected with uh, one of these early onset childhood diseases. And so they partnered with us to f do this thing that we call Project 3000, which is designed to go out in a mass media way and find everybody that has this disease and to raise money along the way to uh, do the genetic testing. This has been so successful, I just looked at our uh, statistics, that we now have 88% of the children between 0 and 10 years of age in the United States identified, and about 65% of the people between 10 and 20. And we have raised enough money to pay for every single test of every remaining person uh, in the United States through this effort. So along the way, we thought, why couldn't we do that for other diseases? And so we got the idea that we could do that same thing for uh, best disease, uh, the condition that uh, we became aware of through uh, Ruth's family. Turns out that best disease is 10 times more common than uh, LCA. So there are many, many more uh, uh, patients in the United States. But because it's a dominant disease, it's 10 times easier and 10 times cheaper to diagnose all the people in the family. And so using approximately the same strategy, we think we can find everybody in the United States with this uh, condition. So uh, Rob Mullins uh, went to college in Wheaton, Illinois, uh, did his PhD here uh, at the University of Iowa uh, with Greg Hageman. After he finished, uh, we were able to hire him on the faculty in the Department of Ophthalmology, where he's been a faculty member in the Center for Macular Degeneration for the last several years. And two years ago, uh, he was promoted to the rank of associate professor. Um, 
Rob and I are now working on a project related to Best Disease in which we're trying to figure out what all the factors are that create the human macula, that central area of the retina that's selectively affected in Best Disease. So for those of you who know how to do uh, stereo images where you just cross your eyes a little bit and that fuses into a stereo thing, you're actually looking from underneath the retinal pigment epithelium here, which is the dull green, the bright green marks are the rod photoreceptors, and that dull red area in the center are the cone photoreceptors in the fovea, and you can see the little foveal depression there. Here's just another uh, very cool image that Rod recently sent me. These again are the, the green, are the rod photoreceptors, and the red uh, ones are the cone photoreceptors, just a little bit eccentric to the fovea, and this is just a sort of give you a little bit of the flavor of uh, Rob's work in which he uh, helps us connect the meaning of the genes and the molecules right down uh, to the level of the tissue so that we can understand what these molecules do in creating uh, the cells that are important uh, to our vision. So with that, I will just say how proud I am of all of the people in that chain. Uh, Dr. Calder, who is such a terrific uh, mentor and friend to so many people uh, in this room. Uh, the Carver family for their uh, incredible two decades of uh, generosity and support for our vision program. But obviously then uh, Marty's father before him, uh, one of the greatest benefactors of all time, uh, whose name is on our College of Medicine, the Carver Hawkeye Arena and so many other things. Uh, but then uh, Rob, who represents really, I think, the, the best uh, of all qualities and a faculty member, we have this um, culture document for our Center for Macular Degeneration, and I reassure you that I'm not going to read you the whole thing. I could, I could see the look of panic cross your face here. But uh, just, just the first couple of bullets uh, to just sort of sum up why Rob is such a great candidate uh, for this wonderful award. Number one, we try to apply the golden rule to everything we do. We take our work very seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. And we communicate with each other frequently to create a shared vision of our shared mission, and the pursuit of this mission is our number one professional goal. And those are the things that Rob Mullins does every day, and it's my great, great pleasure to be part of this ceremony today. So with that, I'm going to introduce my friend, Sean Robillard, to make a few remarks. Probably the most difficult thing in life is to follow Ed Stone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ed. Uh, I want, first of all, to thank you all of, the, all of you to be here, and uh, especially uh, Marty and Ruth for uh, your uh, tremendous uh, generosity and supporting the uh, est and establishing the uh, NCR Calder Professorship in Best Disease Research. It's one of many ways uh, that they choose uh, to support medicine in Iowa, and I cannot uh, thank them enough for uh, their generosity. I would like also to recognize Dr. Uh, Veronica Calder, who is here this afternoon, uh, representing the family. Our father, Dr. Calder, was, as you will hear more, but also, as Ed mentioned before, a pioneer in the field of ophthalmology. And undoubtedly, uh, his name will uh, continue forever to be linked uh, with greatness in ophthalmology, not only in Iowa, but also in the world. I'm also pleased uh, that all of you are able to be here today as we celebrate this very important uh, occasion in the life of that depa of this department and acknowledge really the outstanding uh, contribution of uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Mullins. And that professorship is one of the university's highest honor for a faculty who, like uh, Dr. Mullins, have made major contribution to the college and the university and have earned recognition for excellence in teaching, research, and patient care. Remarkably, the Calder Professorship marks 12 name, chair, and professorship in the Department of Tomology. And there are some of these recipients here in the department. Maybe they can stand and uh, <laughs> The 
let me digress just a minute here. I think when you think about this uh, 12 endowed chair professorship, uh, what does it stand in the College of Medicine? Well, the Department of Medicine has about 200 faculty. They have 16 endowed chair professorship. 12 is in the department of 30 people, about that, isn't it? I think this is remarkable when almost 50% of uh, the faculty have endowed chair and professorship. Uh, this does not happen by accident. It happened because uh, there is leadership in the department. There is leadership with Keith and Ed. There is also a great, a great vision, and the vision is simple in this department, is eradicate human blindness. And there is a team effort, and I think Ed mentioned that a minute ago. And this team effort obviously includes faculty, includes scientists, but include also a passionate group of supporters, and I can tell you how passionate they are. Uh, and this group is led by uh, Ruth and Marty Carver. Uh, this group has also decided to create the Institute for Vision Research with the goal that Iowa becomes, in a very short uh, period of time, the world leader in the eradication of human blindness. And it's our role and my role to make sure that this happens as well and make sure that we create this environment. And obviously, um, as you know now, that why it is uh, impossible to, um, uh, to overstate the importance of private support in helping advance our uh, vital mission. Without question, and our faculty positions strengthened our college as a whole and are truly vital to the respective department as well. And uh, undoubtedly, this gift will also have an extraordinary impact on the Carver Family Center for Macular Degeneration by helping continue its already outstanding track record of excellence. And again, I would like to, end, uh, to extend my sincere uh, thank to Marty and Ruth Carver and uh, for the tremendous leadership and my congratulations to Dr. Mullen as well as to the Department of Ophthalmology. And now I turn to uh, Lynette Marshall. Good afternoon, everyone, and let me add my welcome on behalf of the University of Iowa Foundation. It's a joy to be able to pause just for a moment in the early part of a week and to take this chance to recognize remarkable generosity and remarkable excellence. Rob, congratulations to you. Veronica, we're delighted to have you here um, representing your family and your father. and. Marty and Ruth and Noel, we're delighted to have you here as well, working with us to create um, this opportunity to stop some of the devastation of these blinding eye diseases. It's, it's really a privilege. And investitures, for those of you who haven't been to one yet, um, are really a very special moment in the life of a university. The medallion that will be presented today to Rob represents the Colder and the Carver family legacies, as well as the place of distinction occupied by our university's Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. It is indeed one of the very best in the world, and I think Jean is uh, most appropriate to remind us of the dominance of this department and the recognition that the endowed professorships and chairs provide to our faculty. The endowed faculty positions that are created by private gifts, like the one now recognized um, by the name the Hans-Jörg E.J.W. Kolder M.D. Ph.D. Professorship in Best Disease Research, <laughs> <laughs> These have always been vital to the university, and they now, in these times, hold even greater significance. They help us recruit and retain the very best scientists, and these positions help us leverage other support that is so important to academic medical research. The financial resources enable a department to advance its work across the organization in teaching and in research and in clinical patient care. When a faculty member is named to a professorship, he or she is entrusted with a very precious resource and the confidence of their colleagues. And I think that's what is especially important. 
Being named to a professorship, as Rob and I have already talked this afternoon, is not only a privilege, but it is a responsibility that you have to the future generations. We express our continued appreciation to all the people who have helped make these possible, in particular today to Marty and Ruth for helping establish the Kolder Professorship in honor of Hans-Jörg Kolder. It is a transformative investment for best disease research, and we certainly look forward to the cures and the um, remarkable achievements to come. We hope to be able to continue to report at these sort of uh, celebrations in years to come the successes that we have had in helping literally the blind to see. So thank you to the generosity of our contributors. Thank you to the faculty members who make this work possible. Thank you to the administrators, including Jean and Paul Rothman, and of course, President Mason, in the leadership that they offer to all of us. It is now my pleasure to introduce the leader of this very fine and renowned department, Dr. Keith Carter. And Dr. Carter himself holds the Lillian and Dr. C.S. O'Brien Chair in the department, and he serves as head of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. A good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. It's nice to see such a nice turnout on a Monday, uh, especially uh, this hour today, but it's a very important and exciting time to do each and every one of these. Um, Dr. Colder, uh was probably a very unique person in our department. I mean, he was probably the most soft-spoken person in our department, but he carried a, a lot of influence with that soft-spokenness. Uh, he was uh, served, uh, I think, as uh, interim chair. He was uh, the anterior segment surgeon to the beginners. Uh, but a lot of people don't know about his background in electrophysiology. It was the interesting thing. Some people were asking me, uh, why is this professorship going to uh, something dealing with electrophysiology? I said, but do you know what our electrophysiology lab upstairs is named after Dr. Coder? <laughs> you walk by it every day. Uh, but I don't think they took the time to sit and read the wall. Uh, that was his training, and uh, he just happened to do excel in a lot of areas of ophthalmology, and he spent most of his time in the anterior segment uh, arena, and everybody thought he was that's where his uh, emphasis was, but he was very well versed and, and it's very appropriate that this is being named after him. Um, a couple of things with Dr. Coder that I, and that I learned. Dr. Coder, uh, during the time, used to hold dinners at his house for all the single residents, especially the women residents. <laughs> and it was, you sort of maneuvered to try to get to go to Dr. Coder's house for dinner. These dinners were well spoken of. They, you, they were, I think they were on Thursday nights, and everybody wanted to know what was for dinner on Friday. What, what did you have? What did you have? And he would have everybody out there, and everybody had their assignments and everything. So if you got to go to one of those, it was a treat. The other thing I, I, I was very impressed with was when Dr. Coder retired, it was probably the, the largest retirement party I've ever seen thrown here. Uh, it even beat Bill's, and Bill's was pretty big. <laughs> but this was thrown on the Iowa River, and, and, and I must say there were more women at this, this event. This, so there's one thing I learned. If you're going to throw a good party, you better get a lot of women liking you, boy, because men, we don't throw parties like that for each other. So Dr. Cole was well-liked. Um, Rob, this is your day, and congratulations to you all your work and it's, and it's good that you're being recognized. You're part of uh, our team and, and but today is your day and I, I, I want to thank you for all your excellent work and for this recognition. But at the same time I want to give thanks for the team. The team in ophthalmology that makes this all possible. I'm very happy to be a uh, part of this. I, I'm glad we continue to be, have our successes so I can uh, represent us well and, and, and the Dean will continue to answer my phone calls uh, because, <laughs> you know, a lot of my colleagues around the country, they say, our deans don't answer. I say, well, I don't have that problem. My dean answers. <laughs> so I think part of it is because of the excellence of the department, and I'm glad to be part of that. Um, Marty and Ruth, 
we thank you a lot, but we can't thank you enough, okay? I know being thanked a lot sometimes can get embarrassing, but if we thank you every day, it wouldn't be enough for what you have done to, for us and with us. And I'm so glad you're on our team. And, and, and I'm so glad that uh, we have people like Ed with the vision Ed has uh, to do these things, to be able to tell your mother that he's gonna find a gene uh, right after you got here. That's, that shows you why we're where we are with Ed. And, um, and we're glad that he's with us, but we're also glad that you're with us and you believe in us. And, and I wanna just thank you for all you do for us. Um, with that, I would like to have uh, Lynette come up and Jean come up and Paul come up. And now Rob is medallion time. What we're going to do is invite each of the medallion recipients to come forward and get their medallions. And then after all the medallions are presented, we're going to give each person a chance to say something. So Rob, would you please come forward? And um, Dr. Rothman will present you with the Hans-Jörg E.J.W. Kolder MD, PhD, Professorship in Best Disease Research Medallion. What a joy to be able to share this day, not only with your beautiful wife, Becky, but also with Jenna and Natalie and your sister and your mother who have come up from St. Louis. We're really pleased all of you could be with us. Thank you very, very much. Now I would invite Marty and Ruth Carver to please come forward and accept your medallion. Thank you again. As Keith said, it is hard for us to say thank you enough, but we are grateful for your presence today as well as your <laughs> And Dr. Veronica Calder, I can only imagine how proud your father must have been to have you follow in his footsteps and to be on the faculty here. Please accept this on behalf of our gratitude to you and your family. Now I will invite Dr. Rob Mullins to the lectern. Rob? Well, uh, thank you all so much. Um, I can't tell you uh, what it means to me to, uh, to be having my name associated with uh, Hans-Jörg Kolder. Uh, everyone I've met universally has just told me what a lovely and uh, gentle and kind man uh, Hans-Jörg is. And I had the opportunity to meet him uh, shortly before uh, the meeting today. And it's just, uh, I just uh, really uh, uh, very humbled and, and honored to be, uh, to be associated with him. Uh, I have a few slides, only about 100. <laughs> um, and I actually wanted to talk uh, just for a few minutes today about interfaces. And uh, an interface is defined as a surface between two things uh, that are different from each other. And uh, my career to this point has really been defined by uh, being allowed to exist at, at different uh, interesting interfaces. And so I'd like to share with you uh, a few of those today. So, of course, in science, uh, although it's a bit cliched, uh, we get to work in the interface between the things that are known and the things that are not yet known, or at least the things that we think we know and the things that we, that we don't know. Uh, and occasionally we'll do an experiment and we'll find out, well, we didn't know uh, as much as we thought we did. Uh, but it's such a privilege and uh, an honor to be allowed to come into work every day and uh, while driving into work to think of some experiment or think of some question or some biological mystery, and then uh, if, it's, if it's ethical to do it, and if we can find the resources to do it, uh, and if we're smart enough to do it, we can do it. And uh, I think as, you know, as, as Ed has coached me uh, along my career, uh, that's something that uh, we should really be uh, appreciative of. And uh, just it's sort of amazing that uh, society will, will honor that and, uh, and, and pay for that. Uh, and so, uh, so this is, you know, an, an interface that's 
uh, that's very important that we interact with um, every day. But, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to sort of have an idea, uh, as uh, Grampy here on, uh, from Betty Boop he always has these great ideas, uh, but to turn that idea into something, uh, into some new information or new uh, knowledge, uh, th there's another interface between uh, sort of thinking of something and, and actually uh, making it happen. And uh, in our laboratory, of course, uh, that's the people uh, that, that work in the lab and do the experiments. And uh, I've been very blessed my entire career to uh, just have outstanding uh, students and professional scientists uh, who really sort of uh, uh, do the work uh, and advance the, uh, the cause for us. And so uh, a number of members of our lab are here, and thanks so much for, for being here. Um, another interface that really gets a lot of attention uh, nowadays is the interface between clinical care and basic research. And uh, at least ostensibly, uh, the, the National Institutes of Health uh, really wants to fund translational research. And, uh, and this has really become a, a catchphrase. And um, up to this point, my career has really uh, been, been benefited by being allowed to uh, be part of a clinical department. And uh, you know, as a basic scientist, they don't want me to get too close to the patients because I'll, you know, I'll scare them away and everything. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, when I, when I look at this faculty, um, it's, it's, uh, it's just amazing to me that, uh, uh, that I get to be part of this faculty and the, the fantastic folks that, uh, that I'm allowed to work with and uh, interact with every day. And, you know, this, this has a lot of impact on basic science research, um, maybe more than you might think, uh, not just because uh, my, my clinical colleagues know things that I don't know and can, uh, can help me see a problem uh, from a different light. Uh, but they also have skills to do things that, that I don't know how to do. So surgeons like Arlene Drack and Steve Russell that can uh, inject microliter amounts of virus beneath the retina of a mouse to, uh, to, to rescue uh, a mouse's blindness, uh, to uh, uh, just sort of the knowledge that my uh, colleagues have. And um, it's, just, uh, it's just wonderful to be part of this, uh, to be part of this faculty. And the other way that it really uh, has impacted our work in the area of best disease is that quite often uh, patients of our uh, outstanding clinic are very grateful and their families are very grateful. And they like to leave a donation of their, uh, of their eyes for research. And uh, we actually are able to learn things about human disease in the tissues affected by people with the disease. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that those kinds of experiments could not be done anywhere else and it's why they haven't been done anywhere else. Uh, and so it's really a, a, a just a terrific uh, blessing to be part of this, uh, this great department. Uh, I also wanted to talk briefly about the interface between the mentor and the uh, student. And um, this is mentor on the right there, uh, next to Telemachus. And my daughters could tell you that uh, Telemachus is the son of Odysseus, um, who uh, was mentored by mentor. When, uh, when Odysseus went off to fight uh, in the Trojan War. But a more popular reference would be Yoda and uh, Luke Skywalker, the Padawan and uh, Jedi. And, uh, but in, in either case, a, a mentor is defined as a wise and trusted counselor or teacher or an influential uh, senior sponsor or supporter. And uh, I've just had the most fantastic mentors uh, over my career. And uh, starting with my dad uh, here on the right, and that's me, I was so cute back in the uh, olden <laughs> times. Um, and uh, my dad uh, has, has been ill and wasn't able to be here today, but I'm so uh, surprised and excited to see my mom and my uh, sister, and thank you for, uh, for coming. And here are my mom and dad uh, a, a few years ago. And in science, I've also uh, just had the most spectacular mentors, uh, starting with Judy Medoff at St. Louis University, who uh, really brought so much enthusiasm and excitement into the laboratory, and I was able to uh, learn from her to uh, Greg Hageman, who introduced me to, uh, to the retina and uh, to studying eye disease uh, as a way of understanding uh, important biological questions. And then uh, more recently, uh, I just uh, can't say enough about uh, my, my mentors uh, here at Iowa. And uh, you know, especially I want to point out that uh, Ed Stone, uh, who is just uh, such a model of integrity and uh, uh, creativity and enthusiasm, and uh, it's just uh, fantastic to be part of, uh, of this team. 
and uh, and Keith for his leadership of the department. Uh, thank you so much. Do you, if you can't see that slide on the, on the picture on the right, that's uh, on the day that we went to uh, Wrigley Field and was waiting for Dr. Finger to pick us up at the van. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite late. <laughs> um, and then, uh, boy, you know, I think as we're talking about mentors and students, uh, this is a picture that Tom Weinguy sent me. And uh, as has been mentioned, uh, Hans Jörg just was a fantastic mentor to so many uh, students, he trained dozens of, uh, uh, of, of residents in uh, ophthalmic surgery. And uh, I think it's, it's really appropriate to, uh, to mention him and his, um, his many contributions here. Uh, th there's another interface, and I, I was told not to make the talk too uh, science-y, and so this is going to be uh, a short part. Uh, but it's, uh, there's an interface in, in the eye, and it's an interface that actually allows us to be able to see, so it's, it's, uh, it's very important. Uh, and it's the interface between the, the, uh, the neurons in the retina, which are on the sort of top uh, half of this uh, panel, and the, uh, the, its blood supply, which is on the, the lower half of the panel. And the retina itself, the outer retina, is completely avascular. It's, uh, it's this very finicky, high-performance uh, tissue that can't tolerate any, uh, any sort of uh, disruption to the normal uh, ionic milieu. And on the other side, on the other side of this brown uh, layer uh, on the left, or this yellow layer on the right, is this uh, blood vessel bed uh, where the, the milieu is whatever, you know, if, if, if uh, somebody ate beefaroni, uh, the milieu is now beefaroni in here. And uh, these cells are responsible for maintaining uh, this exquisite interface that allows these uh, photoreceptor cells, rods and cones, to work. And uh, Hans-Jörg uh, Kolder discovered that those cells are also responsible for uh, a voltage potential difference that can be detected in the eye. Uh, and that, uh, that voltage, called the electrooculogram, is flat in patients with, uh, with Best disease. And so, uh, so Dr. Kohler really advanced our understanding of, uh, of how this interface works. And uh, in best disease, uh, shown in, in each of these uh, panels, uh, that exquisite interface is, uh, is completely disrupted and stops working. And so um, one of the things that we uh, hope to be able to advance our understanding of um, uh, with this professorship is why is it that that interface uh, between the retina and its blood supply becomes disrupted uh, when, uh, when patients have mutations in genes that cause um, uh, Best disease, which um, brings me to the, the final interface I wanted to talk about, which is the interface uh, between the lab and its ability to do research and uh, the, resur the resources and support that, uh, that propel that research forward. Uh, and I just want to say to, uh, to Ruth and Marty, uh, you know, for establishing this professorship, uh, thanks would, uh, uh, just for that, that would certainly be enough to, uh, to, for, uh, for all of our thanks. But Ruth and Marty do so much more uh, as well of giving up themselves and their time. And uh, they've been so hospitable uh, to, uh, to our research team uh, and just uh, have really uh, poured themselves into, uh, into the, the effort and, and uh, have really partnered with us. And so, uh, Ruth and Marty, thank you uh, so much. And uh, the message that you care about uh, blinding disease and uh, understanding and curing those diseases uh, just couldn't be more clear. Uh, one other story I want to tell uh, about Marty is that uh, when we were at a, uh, a, a uh, uh, sort of a think tank that Ed had organized, um, and the, the scientists were all gathered and we were sharing uh, our, our plans, uh, Marty was studying genetics. He was teaching himself uh, genetics out of a textbook. And it's just, that is uh, such amazing uh, dedication. And, um, uh, and you know, you, you, we can just tell Marty and Ruth that you're 100% uh, uh, helping the team, and we, we're so grateful. Uh, and, and finally, when talking about support, uh, I need to thank my all-time favorite collaborator, uh, Becky Mullins, who uh, has been unbelievably supportive, uh, whose advice has always been uh, perfect. and. Uh, who's uh, seen me through seasons of grant writing and getting up at four in the morning to go and collect uh, donor eyes in the middle of February. And, um, and uh, the good Lord has blessed us with two daughters, Jenna uh, in blue here and Natalie in yellow. And uh, it's allowed me to experience the mentor-student uh, relationship a little bit uh, from the other side as well. And 
they, they just uh, enrich my life in every way. And uh, so in closing, I just want to reiterate how very much uh, I appreciate the support and encouragement that Ruth and Marty uh, have provided and uh, for your partnership. And uh, I hope I'll be worthy of, uh, uh, of the trust that you've, you've put in us. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about what we'll accomplish together. So thank you so much. Becky and Jenna and Natalie, would you please stand and allow us to thank you for sharing your husband and partner and dad with us. <laughs> and I'd also like to invite the members of Rob's Lab to stand. Please allow us to recognize you as well. Thank you for being with us today, and thanks for the work that you do with Dr. Mullins. Now it's my pleasure to invite Marty Carver to come forward and speak um, on behalf of he and Ruth. It's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, I thought I'd mention a little bit. I, uh, some of you probably have heard this story, but um, Ed invited me over a number of years ago and, and said we're uh, we, we'd like to have you involved in in our organization and and uh, uh, historically uh, what had happened is Ruth's family got involved or her family has uh, has had an association with best disease and uh, Ruth's mother uh, was the matriarch of the family and and uh, my mother-in-law who I adored uh, very much and uh, she was quite a character um, she was at the hospital, and I don't know that this was, was Iowa or not, but um, and later in her life, she, she passed away from, from cancer, but uh, uh, she had a lot of, of doctors uh, looking her over, and, and uh, in one of her moments, she said, you know, half of you guys are below average in your class. <laughs> <laughs> here's all, here's all the, these doctors. So she, she, was, uh, she was fantastic, and, and uh, I adored her very much. And because of that association, uh, Ed, was, uh, Ed invited me uh, to join his group a number of years ago. And I thought at the time I was with Bandag and, and uh, I, oh my gosh, I need another uh, board like I need a hole in the head. And, and uh, so we, get, we kept talking and, and Ed uh, was laying out this culture document. And that's really what got me hooked. Uh, it was virtually, in fact, at that time, I think I could, I could safely say that, you know, in the private sector, uh, I would have loved to have Ed in my organization. I know I couldn't get him out of here with a crowbar, but um, I, the, the intellect and the, um, the, the excitement and, and having this kind of a, of a culture, which he'd already mentioned a few of the things, the, the collaboration, the selfness, uh, Robbie mentioned interface. And to me, I think one of the really f amazing things about how this group works is it's an interdisciplinary group. And I think some of the most fascinating, fun things in science are at the interstices between different disciplines. And they're able to uh, not only do this uh, with, with great uh, elan and, and brilliance and, uh, and also with that special Iowa character of uh, uh, teamwork, uh, and mission focused as opposed to uh, ego focused and everybody has a role to play and and, um, and I'm very grateful that Ed invited me to join the group because it's been a it's just been a blast um, every time I get involved with them there's some new uh, new activity going on some some new uh, discoveries some new research um, and uh, Jean mentioned uh, uh, this, this new approach to the organization I think is extremely exciting. And uh, it's just a thrill for us to be involved. Ruth and I really uh, adore the, all of the people that we've met in the organization as well as the advisory board. So it's just been nothing but a great pleasure. And uh, Rob, I, I, uh, we're looking forward to great things out of you. Not, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but uh, congratulations and uh, and thanks again for this great opportunity. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Ruth. We appreciate the beginnings that came from your mother and her vision um, of working with us here. Um, we're grateful for that very much. And Noel, thanks for being with us today. We're happy to have you here as well. It's now my pleasure to invite forward Dr. Veronica Calder to speak on behalf of her father and her family. Thank you. On behalf of my father and our family, I would like to thank all of you for gathering here today and honoring my father in this very special and particularly generous way. I would like to share a little bit about my father's life and his legacy. My dad is the son of a Lutheran minister and he grew up in Austria amidst the moral and the physical chaos of World War II. He was drafted into the German army at age 16 and injured on the Russian front shortly thereafter. He spent two years in a prisoner of war camp and after being reunited with his family, he took care of his father who died of cancer. For most of us, any one of these life events might have caused us to lose sight of our dreams. But my dad's burning desire since childhood had been to become a Gutmachtokte a doctor who makes things better, and his spirit was sustained. He went on to become the first medical doctor in our family. Despite a near-fatal motorcycle accident in his early 20s and nagging diplopia, he graduated second in his medical school class. As a young man, my dad had an insatiable curiosity and passion for learning. He wanted to know why the human senses work the way they do. He wanted to know how gravity and acceleration affect the senses. And he actually applied at NASA to become an astronaut. My dad always encouraged his children to ask the big questions. Why does it work that way? How does it work? These questions guided his research as a sensory physiologist at Emory and helped him <clears throat> excuse me, to develop the academic rigor that brought him to the attention of Fred Blody, who recruited him to teach physiology at the University of Iowa. My dad didn't want to teach physiology to eye doctors without sharing in the benefit of their clinical training. So in his 40s, he moved our family to Iowa and completed a residency in ophthalmology. My dad had the opportunity to fully develop and his, express his passion for teaching while in the eye department. Whether he was staffing the first cataract extraction with a new resident or stalled in an intersection while he was teaching me to drive, <laughs> my dad had legendary patience. Slow to anger and quick to encourage, he always looked for the good in the other person. I never heard my dad gossip or speak ill of his colleagues. Instead, his focus was always on service, teaching, or on his next project. As my dad matured and we were finally <clears throat> able to convince him of the benefits of retirement, his passion turned to his cow-calf operation, which he considered his second career. You have to love a grown man who unabashedly states that he loves baby animals. He used his considerable obstetrical talents while attending the births of many calves and foals on his farm. My dad brought the same gentle, respectful bedside manner he had used in the hospital to the care of his animals, insisting that more is won through kindness than through force. During the past few months, <clears throat> thanks to this professorship, my dad has received visits, calls, and letters from across the country from his former students and colleagues. He has thoroughly enjoyed these and visibly grew an inch each time I read another letter to him. To Ruth and Marty Carver and the others who helped to make this professorship possible, thank you. Your generous gift has already touched many lives my father's in particular. 
To Dr. Mullins, our heartfelt congratulations and good wishes. May God bless you and guide your work for many productive years to come as you strive to understand blindness and preserve vision. Thank you. Well, uh, I think we'll all agree that this was a uh, phenomenal event, and I just want to thank everyone who participated in it at every level, and to all of you for coming. Uh, we have a reception uh, outside the auditorium that I hope uh, some of you will have a chance to stay and spend a few more minutes. And uh, just in closing, let's give uh, our recipient, our donor, and the daughter of our honoree one more wonderful round of applause.